Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Um, and thank you all so much for having me here today. Um, so as Dan mentioned, I work today as a data scientist at Disney, and my team focuses primarily on personalization for our entertainment products. Um, so what do we mean by personalization? Basically, our ultimate goal is to be able to give our users the best experience possible. And that means having to take into account the fact that every user is different. You know, everyone has their own unique tastes and preferences. And we really want to aim to deliver a curated experience that is most relevant to that user so that we can provide you know, the best experience possible for any given individual. And you know, some examples of that, you know, everyone's playlist is a little bit different, right? So yeah, you we can when we talk about personalization, we have to talk about companies like Amazon and Netflix, who first pioneered uh, the modern personalization platforms. <clears throat> I think you've all probably seen on Amazon the recommended product section, uh, where if you buy something, then all of a sudden Amazon knows all the other products that you suddenly need, even though you didn't know that you needed them yourself <laughs> to begin with. Um, or on Netflix, you have these rows that are curated to your title. So just because you watched one movie, uh, it shows you a whole other list of these other movies that uh, might be of interest to you as well. And so all of these are examples of you know, personalization today. And I think it's also just interesting to note that most modern uh, tech platforms use personalization across their entire platform. So, you know, you might notice it in some of these situations, like in these specific rows, that content is curated for you, but it's actually oftentimes a lot more than just that. So the actual content, the titles that go into these rows are curated. The row of those, like the order of those contents in that row is curated. Even the row of the order of all of those rows placed on a specific page is can oftentimes be curated to a specific user as well. Um, even the thumbnail that's shown, all of these things are things that companies aim to try to personalize and create a better experience for an individual user. And when we talk about uh, recommendation engines, there's kind of two main categories of these. So on the left, you can see an example of collaborative filtering. This is kind of the biggest uh, pioneered recommendation engine that Netflix first started. And really, it just takes the assumption that users have similar buying and viewing patterns. So this can be particularly helpful when there doesn't seem to be a clear pattern or relation between content. So it just is really based off of user behavior. So if I watch something like I watched a horror movie and then a comedy and then a cartoon, and all three of those don't seem you know, related on paper, but then another user also watches that same horror movie and comedy, then we might recommend that cartoon as a recommendation, even though it doesn't seem like that's a natural grouping of those contents, but it's really just based off of user behavior. And then we model people's preferences uh, based off of what other, other people who are similar to you might also be uh, watching. And then there's also the uh, content-based filtering. So that's really, um, it's really more about just finding content similarities. So this is more helpful when uh, you actually have a lot of descriptive metadata on a piece of content or a product so that you can compare these products and descriptions and see you know, which, which contents are actually related to each other, what, where are the similarities? And then that way, if a user watches one of them, then you can recommend um, any other similar content based off of those similarities. Perfect. So um, I'd love to ask you a few questions. And then, um, Jeff, if you could uh, moderate the chat um, to see if there's any other questions that are coming up there that we want to add as well before we start uh, talking about the next section, which is going to be on a day in the life. Um, so really, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to establish kind of the terms of the trade and get everybody a quick data science degree in five minutes. One of the big questions I have is everybody is familiar with two companies that were really the pioneers of personalization. Amazon, when it came to books, and then like pretty much everything else, and Netflix, when it came to movies. 
And as you know, Disney Plus uh, wasn't even around when you know for years when Netflix and Amazon were created. It's a relatively late entrant to the streaming market. To what extent are you just building off of published research that Netflix and, and Amazon data scientists created versus creating your own unique models? Sure, I think that's a great question. Um, I would say that because so much of this research has been published and they've kind of established this status quo of what a recommendation and it should look like, just like I talked about with the collaborative filtering and the user base recs, that's kind of the basic foundation of how all recommendation engines today are formed. Um, so we definitely build off of that framework. However, you know, the exact data that we have access to um, from company to company is going to vary immensely. And so there, so we still end up having to develop models that are specific to our use cases, given the data that we have access to and kind of the specific goals that um, our business unit is trying to accomplish. So while we definitely leverage that research and um, we follow you know, a lot of the similar frameworks and patterns that these other recommendation uh, engines use, ultimately the models are um, our own and we sort of do our own research and uh, development on those for, for our given use cases. And, you know, this brings up an issue that I did want to, you know, a lot of the pioneering work in AI is funded by universities uh, and the research is published as, you, you know, university research often is. And a lot of the pioneering work in AI was funded by companies, but also published in, in public journals. And um, I'm just curious, um, just for those of us who aren't familiar with data science, um, as a data scientist, there are some things that you'll publish to the world, and I guess other things that are more proprietary to your company. And how do you figure out if a, a certain insight, a certain breakthrough, is that something you publish to the world or something you hold back for your own company? Yeah, I do think um, it is a fine balance, you know, between what you want to share versus what you want to keep to a company. Um, but I think that it comes down to, you know, how innovative of a solution have you created? Is this something that is truly, you know, a new way of looking at our data our, at our models? And is it something that can be leveraged by other companies, right? Or anyone else out there? And so I think it really, you just have to sort of weigh the impact, the potential impact to society of like being able to share this with everyone else and letting, also letting these other institutions further that research, right? Because you know, a lot of these uh, models are just, you know, one company will develop something and publish that, and then another company will take that and make it even better. And so I think you have to sort of evaluate the potential impact um, of something that you've invented and then how, yeah, how innovative that solution really is. Yeah. And one of the you know best examples of this, of course, is that the transformer breakthrough, which came out of Google, was the foundational technology for ChatGPT, which ended up being basically its primary rival uh, through Microsoft. So th there's this really interesting push and pull and tug. Um, and I would say that this is a big tension right now within just AI broadly. You know, Elon Musk criticizes Microsoft and Google uh, for not being more open source. You know, Meta had its code leaked and now it's kind of going heavy into the open source space. So you'll start to see a lot of debates about to what extent is this proprietary uh, company owned, or to what extent is this going to be published? Um, I wanted to make a point that um, Annie, uh, I'm sorry, Hannah Paulson uh, said that collaborative filtering, which you were talking about earlier, sounds a lot to persona-based marketing and recommendations. And that is 100% on target. Uh, when we teach um, in our digital marketing class, interest targeting, we actually use the Netflix case study of identifying clusters of interests to help predict what somebody is going to do. And, you know, the classic example uh, is folks who tend to like Adam Sandler movies have a much higher likelihood of being, uh, uh, I'm sorry, people who are in the alt-right have a much higher likelihood of liking Adam Sandler movies. 
And you'd be like, what? Why, why would that be? Well, people in the alt-right like funny movies too. And the Adam Sandler movies typically are kind of my guy meets girl, guy loses girl, guy gets girl back, which is a very traditional formulation for a comedy. And so they found this incredible, um, you know, predictive uh, insight uh, that people who are interested in Adam Sandler movies uh, are going to potentially also be more amenable to a conservative message. And that was one of the ways that Donald Trump was able to win uh, the 2016 presidency. And so um, I did want to, um, there, there's a question, I think, in the in the Q&A. Uh, Jeff, you want to go take that one? Yeah, I think this is actually a really, a really great question. It's from from Oliver. Uh, Annie, I think there's a general concern that personalization can lead to an echo chamber, you know, I, and I can personally attest that when I go on YouTube, it's sending me the same, you know, if I click on too many videos, that's all I'm getting for the rest of my experience. From the perspective of a data scientist or some of the work you're doing on personalization, like what are, how much do you think about like that echo chamber effect and what are the options for, for combating that in a, in a technical sense? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's something that we uh, definitely struggle with all the time <laughs> with all of our models. It's really challenging to try to balance, you know, just trying to continue serving something that we think that the user really wants to watch over and over and over, um, but and trying to balance that with also introducing kind of new content, you know, something that's a little bit more exploratory just to give them some other options that they maybe not had wouldn't have known that they had were interested in on their own. Um, so it's really, it's a really fine balance trying to introduce both of those, you know, just letting it perpetuate um, the given history and activity that the user exhibits and then balancing that with introducing new content that they may not necessarily like, but we still want to give them that option. Um, and then I would say that with all of our models, we also try to incorporate some signals from editorial selections as well. So we still have ed editorial teams that you know curate what they think are interesting titles, what people um, are interested in these days. And so we still rely heavily on editorial teams to kind of put that human in the loop you know, uh, factor to add in some additional titles and contents that we think might be interesting. And so it's a, it's a fine balance between all of these things and trying to um, really optimize for the user's personal preferences, but also what we think they might like, plus what, yeah, what else is out there. That's interesting. Now, so it's even though you're using some of the coolest technology in the world, you're still using people to, to help drive some of those suggestions. <laughs> yes, I think that is a um, very important takeaway that I know Dan mentioned earlier as well. You know, all of this is ultimately about combining AI and humans, right? It's not just relying on AI alone. Now, um, how you know AI and data science are not synonymous. A lot of the math that the recommendation engines that Netflix and Amazon built was in it was nineteenth century math. And so, could you just talk about how you use AI and AI tools in your work as a data science at Disney? Yeah. So I think, like Jeff mentioned earlier. Um, Data science kind of is a, and maybe I guess I'm getting in, ahead of myself into the next section, <laughs> but really it's a combination of all of these tools, right? We have to leverage um, math and statistics, but we also need to be able to scale that to uh, big data and use programming and computer science to enable us to do that. And kind of the combination of all of that ultimately is how we can build these AI solutions that are, you know, learning and better predicting on these models that, um, that, yeah, that originally were developed to begin with. Perfect. Yeah. The, the lesson here, guys, is use data in your business and AI tools can help you use data in your business, but you don't necessarily need to use AI to be able to use data in your business.